Today we're going to talk about networks of neurons. How do we get those individual units to wire up and do something useful? We're going to start off by focusing on the biology of networks and uh, understanding a lot more about how actual neurons in the brain are connected. Then uh, the feedforward flow of information we'll look at in the context of categorization and distributed representations. This picks up with the ideas of neurons as detectors and what the pandemonium model was doing. Then we'll look at bidirectional connectivity, which we haven't looked at yet in terms of how neurons send activity to each other. And so they send excitatory connections and then get information back from other neurons that they've been talking to. And you get this kind of mutual admiration society. The neurons, again, are very social. They love that positive feedback. Um, and a lot of how computation proceeds in the brain can be understood in terms of that bidirectional connectivity. And the key kind of computational level idea here is one of attractors, attractor dynamics, which comes out of chaos theory, which you may have heard of. Uh, and then finally, we'll look at how inhibitory interneurons give rise to competitive dynamics, which are really important for learning. So when we get to the next chapter, we'll see exactly how that competition plays out in the context of learning and also just basic kind of regulation of the activity of the brain, keeping the brain in a good overall state of activation, not too hot, not too cold. In fact, you can really understand inhibition in terms of an air conditioner kind of an analogy. This is a picture of the two main types of neurons in the cortex, the excitatory neurons on the left, which are known as pyramidal cells. Uh, you can see that because they have these little kind of pyramid shaped cell bodies. Uh, you should notice that they have wide ranging connectivity. The cell body is kind of there, but the individual neurons have really, really big uh, axons and dendrites that are branching very far. And it turns out that these neurons, the pyramidal cells, which comprise about 85% of the neurons in the cortex, are the principal information processing neurons of the brain. These are the ones that we've been talking about that are doing the heavy lifting, that are doing all the computation. When we model neurons in our simulations, we're modeling these excitatory pyramidal cell neurons. They're processing the inputs from other pyramidal cells and passing those on through these long range connections onto other parts of the brain. There are also, however, a large variety of local inhibitory interneurons. And so interneuron basically just refers to a local kind of neuron that connects locally. You can see the patterns of uh, branching of their dendrites are much, much smaller, much more spatially contained. That's what it means to be local. They have elaborate funny names like chandelier cells and double basket and double bouquet and uh, all these other kinds of uh, interesting names. And when you look at like detailed anatomy of uh, cortex, people have really gone into detail about all the different types of inhibitory interneurons. It's amazing how many different types of inhibitory interneurons there are. Whereas there's really just a few main types of excitatory cells. It appears that this kind of process of regulation is something that requires different kinds of connectivity, different types of cells. Um, it has a lot also to do with things like sleep and wake and alertness. Um, overall regulation of the activity levels of the brain. And so different cells play different jobs in those different states. We, of course, are trying to find a simple way of understanding what's going on in the brain. And so we're generally going to try to get rid of as much of that complexity as possible and just have a, a very basic uh, role for the inhibition, which actually, in fact, in most of our models, we don't even have any specific inhibitory neurons in our models, we summarize their effects with a set of equations. We're undoubtedly losing something in the process, but we're also gaining a lot of uh, simplicity in our models as a result. So uh, just like with spiking, we're always uh, playing this game of trying to find that golden middle zone where we have enough of the biology to kind of capture what is really going on in the brain, but not too much. And we're really focusing on the cortex as our primary uh, brain area of interest. That's where most of cognition takes place. The cortex has six separable layers. If you look anatomically at the cortex, 
you can see on the left here these these kind of bands of dark cell bodies that are stratified, uh, generally speaking. And again, uh, cortex means kind of layered. That's what it means in Latin or something like that. We're going to look in detail and see that there, there are different functions associated with each of those different layers. And that gives us a way of uh, using what we know from the biology to think about the structure of information flow in the network, how these different layers are connected both within each other, within a, a given area and across layers, across different areas. Um, so there's a wealth of information about the uh, structure of the cortex that really helps inform how we construct our models. One of the most interesting things about these different layers is that they are differentially organized in different parts of the neocortex. And so this diagram on the right shows you A, B, C, D, four different areas in different areas of the cortex each of which is um, kind of a, a prototype for a different type of cortical function. So A, it turns out, is primary visual cortex. So this is where all the visual information is coming in from your retina. And you could imagine that there's gonna be some kind of anatomical specialization for that area relative to other areas. B is an area just outside of that that's kind of a higher level visual area. C is primary motor cortex, so generating motor actions. That's going to have very specialized uh, neurons that are important for get, uh, driving your muscles. There's uh, different areas that have been identified purely on anatomical grounds based on the relative thickness of these different six layers in, the, in each of these different areas. So this is really the basis that Brodman used for carving up the brain into these different areas. If we look at uh, this primary visual cortex area, V1, also known as area 17 in the Brodmann specification, you can see that it has a really uh, extensive set of layer four areas. So each of the different um, layers from one to six are labeled. Uh, they go from the outside, the upper part, the outer part of your brain down into the more <laughs> medial part of your brain. You've got so much layer four that it's actually subdividable into these now Greek level le letters, alpha, beta, etc. cetera. Um, and so that gives us a clue that something in layer four is really important for kind of visual input information processing. Five and six, relatively speaking, are, are, are not as thick, not as many cells in layer five and six. When we're in higher levels of visual cortical processing, so not receiving direct visual input, but receiving indirect input from this V1 area, we see a great expansion, especially of layer three, but also of layer two. And this is telling us something really interesting. Layer four now is relatively compact. You still have a kind of similar layer five, six uh, thickness, but what you really notice is that two and three are much bigger. So this gives us a clue that those areas may be important for this kind of internal processing of information, whereas four seems to be much more important for receiving sensory inputs. Now when we go to area C, we see that layer five and six now are greatly expanded in this area. And again, this is primary motor cortex. And so this tells us that these areas are really important for sending those kind of motor outputs. And in fact, the very largest neurons in the brain, in the cortex, are to be found. Uh, the giant pyramidal cells in layer five uh, send this direct connections down to like your big toe uh, through the spinal cord and actually really do connect directly to your kind of muscle uh, system. Those projections originate in these deep layers. We call these the deep layers because they're kind of further down. Um, and uh, that's giving rise to essentially the output of the, the brain. So now we're seeing this really nice story emerging here that you have kind of input, sort of internal processing, and then output area D. This is pri uh, prefrontal cortex, and it seems to be kind of a, a, an all around player a midfielder in soccer, somebody who's doing a little bit of everything. We can actually reduce that six layers by looking at those different specializations into essentially three primary functionally organized layers in any given cortical area.
So uh, as we saw, layer four seems to be receiving the sensory input. Um, this comes into the cortex by way of the thalamus for all of our senses except for olfaction, which goes directly without, uh, that bypasses the thalamus. But it turns out actually that also layer four has a specialized type of neuron called a, a stellate cell that is particularly uh, specialized for receiving that kind of input. And it's actually also more of an interneuron. It has more local uh, close range projection. So it kind of collects all these inputs that it's receiving from the sensory input and then sends those up to the pyramidal cells in the superficial layers two and three. And we call those hidden layers kind of historically, that's what they were called in early neural network models, uh, areas that are particularly important for processing information forming higher level representations, internal encodings of that information that are going to uh, be what we talk about when we say that the brain is categorizing or organizing information. So it's most of the models that we're doing in this class are really essentially models of layers two, or three, two and three, the superficial layers of the cortex. Then finally, the output, uh, as we said, comes from these deep layers, five and six, they project out into subcortical areas down into your motor system. They also project into the basal ganglia, uh, widespread connections into the basal ganglia. So when we get to the motor chapter in chapter seven, we'll be talking more about what the function of those are. Also go into the cerebellum. So all these different kind of subcortical areas that are doing important other more specific functions in your brain, receive that information by way of these deep layer output projections. Interestingly, the output layers also project down into the thalamus, the very same kind of thalamic areas that are projecting back up into the cortex. So there's actually a corticothalamic loop here going through these different circuits. And this is the basis of a sort of canonical circuit of the cortex that has been identified 